Well, good morning, everyone. I, I don't know that I've ever introduced anybody online like this, but anyway, on, on Zoom or whatever it is. So, um, you know, Chris, uh, probably most of you know Chris Kruger. Chris joined us from uh, Methodist Hospital of Park Nicollet last year. He was practicing there for 10 years. Yep. Yep. And uh, he's been in Minnesota for a long time before uh, for actually joining the Park Nicollet group. He did his residency, his cardiology fellowship, and his EP fellowship at the University of Minnesota. And before that, he was at um, Omaha, Omaha Creighton right. University, uh, where he did his medical school, and he had, you know, got his PhD from there as well. Um, I know he spent a long time preparing for this talk, and I know last time he spent a long time probably deleting slides about his Kansas City Chief. <laughs> so him being here is, shows his dedication, so don't, don't be tough on him. Chris, uh, uh, go ahead. All right, well, thank you, uh, Brad. I appreciate the introduction. Um, anyway, it's great to be here. Thanks for inv the invitation to talk. And yes, this first slide would have looked different if there was a different outcome yesterday in the game. So anyway, the title of the talk, 2020 EP Review for the Non-EP, um, no disclosures. Real quick, just to kind of um, give you some background in case you get a picture randomly on your phone of me. This was my introduction to MHI in some people's phone initially. Um, I think I know where it came from, but uh, it popped up on some people's contact uh, on their phone when people shared their contact. In fact, I think this was the picture you had of me looking for that person in the when you of walked in to meet me and I had been doing Movember and obviously I didn't have any hair up there. I would like to say this is how I look on the weekend, but uh, um, that was a while ago. This picture is from this picture with me and my wife at a barn dance in 1995. You'll notice the flannel and the boda there. So uh, um, in case you guys uh, get this on your phone, this is where that picture comes from. So um, methods of preparing for this talk, uh, pretty straightforward, purely subjective. You know, it's kind of a wide, encompassing to topic, and the last thing I wanted to do was start showing a bunch of his recordings and intracardiacs that really a lot of people aren't interested in. So I avoided, avoided articles that focused on technical EP issues. Um, I thought about having some COVID-related articles, but uh, I think that wouldn't really have served much purpose. I think we're going to need some time to figure out EP-wise, what COVID specifically causes. Um, but most of what I'm going to show is kind of me just subjectively picking uh, articles and things from, from uh, various aspects of EP. So kind of three objectives. Uh, I want to identify some advances and potential advantages for implantable devices, mainly to give everyone kind of a flavor for what is new and what may, me do, may, may uh, become new down the road. Uh, I want to identify some limits on, uh, in monitoring tech, um, and then I'm going to list some kind of uh, newer data on AFib topics. Um, so going to the first topic, uh, new and new devices and those that are in the pipeline. So r really the, the only kind of new one I'm going to highlight is what's called micro-AV. So you guys probably are aware of the, our micro leadless pacemaker. It's a single chamber right ventricular pacemaker. Um, primarily, we use it in patients with uh, uh, permanent AFib or high burden AFib uh, that need ventricular pacing. Um, and I, th I thought this was, when I first heard how they ended up making this micro AV, I thought it was uh, pretty uh, ingenious. Um, so I'm going to review that here. So this uh, is a review of the Marvel 2 study. And the Marvel 2 study uh, was built off uh, results from the Marvel study um, back in 2018, published in Heart Rhythm. And that initial Marvel study looked at 64 patients, uh, 33 of which had high degree AV block. And I'll show a picture on how this works. But basically, they use the accelerometer that's already in the pacemaker. The accelerometer is what's responsible for the rate response mechanism. And they used um, this accelerometer to basically sense the atrial activity. And by doing this, they were able to show that they could actually create AV synchrony by this one device in the right ventricle sensing atrial activity using the accelerometer. So with the Marvel 2 study, which was published last year in Jackie P, um, they used this same algorithm 
uh, but in a, a larger number of patients, uh, more centers. Um, so 75 patients, 40 of which uh, had predominantly sinus rhythm with complete heart block. And they downloaded this uh, acceler accelerometer-based algorithm into the, uh, into the already placed micro. Um, and their primary efficacy uh, objective was to demonstrate superior uh, ability for this algorithm to provide AV synchronous pacing in this VDD mode, which was uh, um, the mode once you downloaded this software, versus what it normally functions in uh, in BVI 50. And then they had a safety endpoint, making sure there was no pauses or, or heart rates that got uh, too fast. So. There we go. This picture kind of shows what it does. So over on the right lower quadrant, you'll see um, the micro. And it actually has three accelerometer act in it that has each have a different axis. And any type of movement, uh, i.e. the accelerometer, causes some type of uh, change in that vector. And then what they noticed was looking here, you can get this activity just based on um, any movement, and some of these spikes correlate with um, things that are happening uh, with regards to blood flow, and therefore in the top chamber, the valves, et cetera. <clears throat> and this kind of gives you an idea of how they're able to, um, uh, uh, to, to follow the atrial activity. So based on what we already know um, from uh, the cardiac cycle, these different uh, impulses or signals correlate with certain parts of the cardiac cycle. And specifically this A4, uh, which we already know where it happens, correlates with the atrial kick. Um, and by looking at this signal, uh, and this gets into a lot of technical stuff that I don't totally understand, but they're essentially uh, blanking a period of time after the ventricular event, so they ignore these first two and they focus on looking at signals, uh, the A3 and A4, and usually, especially in someone with a good contracting atrium, the A4 signal is much higher. <clears throat> and by doing this, they dramatically increased uh, AV synchrony compared to the standard um, uh, VVI mode of the pacemaker. So by doing this uh, download, they were able to increase the AV synchrony from 26.8% up to 89.2%. Um, in this VDD mode. Um, uh, the best AV synchrony was noted at rest with about a 94% uh, um, um, uh, amount of AV synchrony. Um, and uh, a lot of patients had a high percentage of AV synchrony. So you wouldn't get 100%, but 95% had more than, more than 70%. And um, they also uh, showed that uh, this AV synchrony increased uh, the stroke volume based on certain echo uh, parameters. So you may wonder why in a VVI mode you would have still 26.8% um, AV synchrony. And I think the next picture kind of highlights this. So these are different tiles from different patients from the same article, the Marble 2 study. Um, showing examples of patients with different degrees of uh, uh, I improvement in AV synchrony. And I'll kind of hone down on this bottom one. This is someone that really didn't get any benefit. And they defined AV synchrony as a ventricular event, either sensed or paced within 300 milliseconds um, after a surface P wave. That's how they defined it, and that's where you get this, this dotted line here on all the graphs. And what you see in this patient is pretty much just a flat line across the board. And this kind of highlights that just per chance, a certain number of these intervals are going to fall under that 300 milliseconds. So I think that 25% or so is just kind of what uh, would normally happen at baseline. And then you also have patients that will have intermittent heart block. And that obviously is going to give you some degree of AV synchrony. But you look up here at this top one. <clears throat> um, and you can see an example of a patient that had marked improvement um, with this algorithm. So uh, again, it doesn't happen in everyone, but uh, a lot of patients do, uh, do pretty well. <clears throat> so later in the year, I think the Marvel 2 study was published in January, if I remember. And then later in the year, I think in December in Heart Rhythm, <coughs> Garogan and Associates uh, looked at 64 patients from this Marvel 2 study. And um, what they showed was that the 
high degree of AV synchrony, as I talked about earlier, showing those, those A, A1, 2, 3, 4 signals, most commonly happen in patients with really good amplitude A4 signals, which correlates with good atrial mechanical functions. And they could predict a good response <coughs> to this algorithm uh, if they had an E A ratio less than 0.94, um, and also if there was a low sinus rate variability. So this may um, at some point kind of help us guide who would get this type of therapy or even give us, give us insights into uh, other t aspects of care of these patients. Um, so I show this study really not because we're putting in a lot of these, um, because frankly we're not, but I do think there are probably a small subset of patients out there uh, that would benefit from this. Uh, more to kind of give an example of what the technology can do for us, advancing us, um, and also to give you an idea of, of what's out there. So appropriate micro-AV patients, uh, lack of atrial pacing indications, infrequent pacing, vascular access issues, sedentary patients, other comorbidities. If I think back, uh, one patient year, years ago, I had a patient on dialysis who really did not have a lot of vascular uh, access uh, availability. And he would really go into heart block when his K got a little above normal. Not through the roof, but a little above normal. So it happened, you know, basically once a month. So that was, would have been a perfect example of a case that probably would be good for this micro AV. Um, as f this is the only slide I'm going to talk about or briefly talk about kind of investigational things. None of the things here are approved as of yet, but I think they give you an idea of what's out there, what's in the pipeline. Um, you know, when I came out of training, uh, I honestly thought we had kind of reached the ceiling for what we had available from a pacing standpoint. Um, and then his pacing came back into vogue, and we have numerous other options for CRT, quadrupolar pacing. Um, and now we're kind of getting all these other devices that, um, that expand our, our options and, and make things, it's a lot more fun, but uh, make things more complex. So these are three studies that um, either are or will be uh, um, ongoing in the near future. So the first one there, that EVICD, is shown in the top template. So you all are probably aware of our subcutaneous ICD that involves putting the can here and tunneling a lead up here uh, um, uh, subcutaneously. Um, this is same type of concept, um, but instead we tunnel the lead underneath the sternum up here in this uh, picture, you see the, the delivery uh, um, tunneling mechanism um, here. Um, and this is hard to see, but you see this squiggle. That's the, uh, the actual ICD uh, lead, um, and then a lateral, obviously. So uh, the PI here is Dr. Gornick, and I think the first one was placed last month, uh, if, if I recall. Um, solve CRT uh, involves placement of an endocardial um, LV uh, device that's as pictured here by this penny. And it works with some other hardware, including a, a, a co-implanted uh, can, along with a battery for this that supplies uh, a, a generator that basically activates this. So a number of components, but it offers uh, an alternative to patients who don't respond or you can't do uh, standard uh, transvenous CRT. Um, and I believe Dr. Sengupta and Dr. Moore are PIs here, and I, 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 I'm not sure who across the, across the river is our, uh, uh, <coughs> are the PIs over um, uh, in the East Metro, but I know they're doing this over there. Um, and then this here is uh, a study that's yet to get going, but I think it's tentatively this summer. It involves placement of a four French ICD lead. Um, it's got basically it's an integrated, integrated bipolar, so it's got the tip and then it's got the coil and that's it. So that's what allows it to be very small. It's four French, same size as our typical HIS lead. Um, and uh, Dr. Zakabe uh, is uh, going to be the PI here. And I think Dr. Vaderat over uh, in the East Metro. Um, so this is an example of just things that are going to be going on around here. You'll see people with these devices potentially. And obviously, depending on how the studies go, um, these things could come into uh, real life use. So moving on to the next topic, implantable loop recorders. Um, they're great. They do a great job, especially the, the one now is so small. We just put a nick and slide it underneath the skin. Um, but one thing that 
we are seeing on a constant basis is a pretty high degree of false positive transmissions. Um, so this was a study in heart rhythm last year uh, that looked at 695 remote transmissions on 559 patients over four weeks. The indications for implantation of loop recorders are, are as such, so AFib surveillance in 321, cryptogenic stroke in 168, and syncope in 70. Um, primary reason for false positive uh, uh, transmissions uh, scheduled was signal dropout or undersensing, and then an alert uh, um, transmission was because of either PACs or PVCs. And this is kind of illustrated over here, uh, the results. Um, and you just see a very high number of false positives, especially in the cryptogenic stroke and syncope patients, um, but also in the AFib patients. Um, and this just highlights the extreme importance of, judic uh, of adjudication of all these results. And I think this applies to not only implantable loop recorders, but in a minute I'm going to review some data on wearable tech, uh, which is not that's not going away. It's going to just increase in numbers and, and numbers of patients using it. And really adjudicating, getting the, the data or getting more data if, if you don't trust what, what a patient is showing you. They, in this study, showed that the amount of time for one false positive transmission uh, ate up about 30 to 45 minutes of the device nurse and EP physician time. I think it's a little bit uh, long, but definitely there are cases that uh, they've gotten me involved that do take, uh, you know, me probably five, ten minutes, but you include the time they spent doing it. I don't think it's uh, uh, unreasonable that this uh, can happen. So this is an example I'll show. So this is a 70-year-old female admitted to Abbott Northwestern Hospital um, in December. She presented with left-sided facial droop and worsening uh, uh, weakness. Uh, she had a CTA with occlusion of the middle, uh, origin of the middle of the M2 branch of the right MCA. She unfortunately was outside of the window for TPA and not a mechanical thrombectomy, thrombectomy candidate. She ended up having uh, an ILR placed uh, a few days later um, for cryptogenic stroke. So this, um, a lot of data here, but this is uh, part of one of her transmissions. So this was in December, it's February now. She's already had a few transmissions. And this kind of tile down here um, kind of is one of the first things that we get. And I always kind of look at this, it kind of gives me an idea of how the AFib's been behaving uh, based on uh, time. So implant is over here on the left, and then device interrogation is, is the right line. And initially you see it and you just see, well, it looks like she's had a bunch of AFib. And then um, a few pages later you get this. You get a whole list of all these events that are labeled as AFib. So again, not hard to imagine it could take a device nurse a lot of time to go through all these events. Now, all these events don't always have data, but up here is uh, a dot plot of one of these events um, uh, labeled as AFib over here. Uh, and this is a blow up of the actual EGM signal. <clears throat> so I would call this a fairly easy one to interpret, but if you're going through 20 of them, it can take a while. Uh, you know, when I look at this dot plot, I look at it and say, well, sure it's labeled AFib, but why is it, you know, you have these, this cutoff, low cutoff is so straight. It's just, you know, looking at this, I would question whether it's really AFib. And when you look at the actual EGM data, uh, you see clear P waves, PAC. So, the, you know, the reason this is so irregular is frequent PACs, uh, probably some runs of uh, non-sustained uh, SVT, and then sinus arrhythmia. I think account for this uh, this here, um, but I've seen patients where this you don't see the P wave. You know, it all depends on the signal. And if you don't see a P wave or the baseline is just flat, it can be really, really hard. Um, so, um, but again, this highlights uh, that the fact that you really have to adjudicate all these all these results. Um, and uh, the other thing I would point out is. You know, when you look at those device interrogations, um, whether it's a pacemaker, ICD, or, or a loop recorder, you know, the device is just following an algorithm. It's calling this AFib purely based on an algorithm. So when you see ATAF, 
on a device report. Usually the nurse, the device nurses are really good about, you know, explaining their interpretation down in the assessment, but you got to take that, that uh, diagnosis by the device with a little bit of grain of salt. So wearable tech, um, it's expanding. Uh, every time I think about wearable tech, I think of this patient, and this was the first sentence out of her mouth. It all started when I got my Apple Watch. And I looked at her and I go, well, I think you need to get rid of your Apple Watch. And <laughs> the husband was right by her and he's like, you know, just nodding his head. Like, uh, you could clearly tell this kind of took over her life. And all she was thinking about was the data she was getting from her Apple Watch. Um, but as I said earlier, this is not going away. Um, uh, this is kind of crazy. They're estimating that the market for wearable tech will be upwards of 27 plus billion dollars in 2026. Um, the percentage of people using wearable tech is only going up, so they estimate 9% in 2014, going up to 33% in 2018. And by 2022, uh, they're estimating that 67 million people in the U.S. will be using wearable tech in some, uh, some fashion. Um, so we're going to be continuing to kind of deal with this, um, and things will constantly change. So this is a, a study looking at the Alive Core or Cardio Mobile app, which at least uh, for a while was the most common thing that I was uh, dealing with with my patients. And I think it's a really good tool. I think it does a good job in most patients. So um, this was a study. They basically combed the literature and picked out 11 good studies that looked at using the Alive Core for atrial fibrillation screening. And this was published uh, here last year. And they show the sensitivity and specificity um, as a result of all these different trials. And sure, you have some outliers um, showing crummy specificity or relatively low sensitivity. But overall, I would look at these numbers and say, I think it detects it pretty well. Um, and usually, the specificity is pretty respectable. Um, in these studies, the rate of AF detection was between 0.8 and 36 percent. Again, uh, I would look at these numbers and say they're, they're rather good. But a couple take-home points, um, and this is important to keep in mind when you're educating your patients about these things, um, is that it doesn't pick up everything. And even though you may get data suggesting that you have AFib or uh, something else, it may still be wrong. So, you know, I definitely talked about this with patients that are contemplating <laughs> getting a device. Uh, that patient that I talked to who was talking about her Apple Watch, I would tell her you shouldn't get any of these things. So there are patients where I say I don't think it's a good thing for you. Um, but uh, I, I think this study shows that this, this uh, live core, at least uh, this device, uh, does a pretty good job at what, it, what it's designed to do. Um, I will comment also on this that these studies, how they did them were a little bit different than how I have been using them, um, except in rare patients. You know, these studies were really primarily looking at uh, screening. And we don't, at least I don't use CardioMobile to widely screen a bunch of patients. Um, that would take a pretty organized approach, but that may be where we're going um, at some point in the future. Um, this was kind of a cool study, I thought, um, that looked at the accuracy of certain wearables in SVT. So this was published in Heart Rhythm last year, and they took 52 patients uh, that had SVT, and during an EP study, so while they're laying down, now while they're on a treadmill doing their thing or whatever, but while they were undergoing the EP study, they went into SVT and they would put a device on their wrist. Um, and what they found was a fair amount of variability depending on the device. <clears throat> um, so first of all, all the devices were pretty inaccurate at short bursts of SVT. I think the cutoff was basically less than a minute, but the shorter the worse. Um, they commented that if the device detected an elevated heart rate, at least at rest, um, it is likely real. Um, and some of the devices, and in this study at least, the two on the left, I think it was the Polar and the Apple, they uh, found were more accurate at detecting elevated heart rates during longer SVT. Um, 
but you look at even, now granted these are the short duration, but and you look over here, this looks worse just because the, the dot plot doesn't get better with longer. I, I think this just points to the fact that still you need to have good data that you can actually review. And fortunately on these, these heart rate only recordings, all you do is you get a heart rate that's reported by the patient usually. Um, really you need, you, need a, you need a tracing in some shape or form. Um, but you know, some of the wearables that are out there I think do a pretty good job. Um, moving on to the final topic, and this is kind of where I had trouble determining where to go. Uh, I felt like this topic was kind of shatter blot. Um, I kind of focused on kind of four areas. This first uh, article dealt with uh, the risk of dementia in AFib and the role of oral anticoagulation in affecting that risk. And then I went in to kind of look at some uh, various risk factors that can contribute to AFib and success rates of rhythm control. Uh, and then the final two uh, slides are a little slightly different topics. Um, so kind of a number of different things. But what I'm trying to get out of this is to kind of give people uh, some data to educate their patients a little better about things um, from a general cardiology standpoint. So, you know, I think we have some data already, uh, sh definitely data showing that AFib is associated with dementia um, and uh, cognitive decline. Um, and I think we also have some data suggesting that oral anticoagulation reduces this. And this is kind of more data uh, along those lines. So this was published last year in Heart Rhythm. It's a retrospective cohort study um, of UK primary care data from 17 years, uh, 2000 to 2017. And it included uh, quite a few patients, so just under 85,000 of patients with AFib, a little over 35,000 were on oral anticoagulation and just under 50,000 were not. Um, and what they found, this is kind of the main point of the study, was there was about a 10% lower risk uh, of um, uh, dementia or cognitive decline uh, in patients uh, that were on oral anticoagulation versus not. Um, and I think part of the reason I'm showing this is I've had a number of patients come to me and one of their main concerns with AFib was the risk of dementia. That was one of their main concerns. And I think this kind of gives me at least a little bit of uh, <clears throat> specific data to say, yeah, you know, it, it really uh, highlights the need to do oral anticoagulation and allows you to maybe convince them that that's the way to go. Um, there was no difference in this study of warfarin versus DOEX, but they comment they probably didn't have uh, the power to really show this difference, uh, especially when you consider that DOEX weren't available during uh, a large part of this time period. The other thing that they found was there was actually an increased risk of dementia in patients on oral anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. Um, you know, a few different mechanisms may be responsible for this, but I think it highlights the, what we're all trying to do is in those patients that are on both, really looking at why are they on aspirin, why are they on Plavix and oral anticoagulation. It's really easy just to leave things be and not, not change medications around but I think we've gotten better uh, at looking at the original indication for those things and trying to peel things back uh, if, it's, if it's not a good reason uh, for them to, them to be on both. Um, and then you look at this graph over here, I think it just highlights that the, in all patients, again, uh, what they commented was about a 10% lower risk of uh, dementia on oral anticoagulation. So moving on. The next three slides are kind of looking at different, I'm um, sorry, four slides, uh, four studies, looking at different risk factors associated with AFib. This one I thought was pretty interesting. This was published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine, I think back in January of 2020. And it was a prospective study looking at the effect of alcohol moderation uh, on AF recurrence. Um, six hospitals in Australia, 140 patients, uh, and the Patient populations were patients with AFib that drank at least 10 or more alcoholic beverages per week. Um, they randomized these patients into an abstinence and a control group. And in the abstinence group, 
those patients were able to reduce their beverage consumption from 16.8 on average down to 2.1 drink, uh, drinks per week. 61% um, of these patients had complete abstinence. And they had a, seemed to have a pretty robust way to make sure this was true. If they had any patients that were reporting zero, uh, zero drinks, they would actually have them come and do um, testing, urine testing. Um, and then the control, there was a slight uh, decrease in alcohol consumption, but, but not significant. Interestingly, this was out to six months, and I think this, uh, this fact about this study highlights how hard this can be. They had initially planned on doing this a whole year, but they couldn't enroll enough patients because not enough people wanted to abstain for a whole year. So because of that, they reduced it from a year down to six months. So that's where you get the 180. Um, they ignored two weeks after a blanking period, and <clears throat> what they showed was um, that at six months, there was much more freedom from AFib recurrence in patients who abstained, um, 53 versus 73 um, percent. And the overall AFib burden uh, over six months uh, was lower in patients who abstained. So, you know, I think a lot of the studies we have out there, um, you know, they're not prospective like this, that's kind of what I, what I liked about it. Um, uh, it was, I think, very well done. But this gives you the ability to really tell patients, hey, if you, if you decrease uh, or hopefully stop your alcohol consumption, it can tangibly uh, uh, decrease your AFib burden without doing other things. Um, this was published a little bit later last month, again looking, I'm sorry, last year, again looking at alcohol and the AF, AF, AF risk in healthy adults. Uh, this was a retrospective screening uh, of healthy patients that had no AFib. <clears throat> so, and the other thing they did is they excluded really any type of medical history or even any surgical history. So these are really healthy patients. Uh, it was a, a study done in South Korea from 07 to 15, but uh, quite a few patients, just under 20,000. Um, average follow-up was about seven years or so. Um, and what they found was any alcohol use increased the risk of AF. So that's kind of a, 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 a talking point you can use for your patients. However, the highest risk was for frequent uh, and specifically binge drinkers, as I highlighted over here in the, in the graph uh, here. Um, and again, I, I think this data will help me kind of educate patients a little bit more about um, you know, these are always asking, can I have a glass of wine or this or that? And, and it's hard to give them guidelines or, or guidance in that regard, but I think this gives you a little bit of ability to kind of be a little bit more specific in, 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 in what to say to patients. <clears throat> this is a study looking at the impact of bariatric surgery on AF type. So, uh, you know, it's another big topic in our AF, AFib patients is talking about weight loss. Uh, I find that most patients when you start talking about it, their eyes kind of glaze over and you don't get anywhere. But there are occasional patients where, where you make some, some headway. Um, and we have a lot of data, more and more coming out, showing that uh, weight loss improves uh, AFib management. Um, I think uh, the, the number that I uh, tend to remember is about a 10% uh, decrease in weight can go a long way in improving uh, AF burden. So this was kind of looking at our the obese of the obese, so patients that are undergoing bariatric surgery. Um, this was a retrospective against study looking at uh, 440 patients, consecutive patients in 07 2000 to 2013. Um, I believe it was done at the Cleveland Clinic. Interestingly, in the 220 control patients um, that had an average of 10.1% loss in their weight, they had no AF reversal. So this kind of uh, goes against what I just said uh, about kind of what I tell patients. I don't know the explanation for that other than, you know, this, these are again the obese of the obese patients who are being considered for bariatric surgery or undergoing bariatric surgery. And um, maybe when you get that obese, you just need to lose more, I guess is the only thing I can, I can the way I could explain that. In the 220 that underwent um, a bariatric surgery, um, these numbers are the percentage of weight that they lost, and they looked at AF reversal. So that's kind of highlighted over here in the top tiles. 
depending on your gastric bypass uh, mechanism or procedure, either gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, or banding. Um, these are how pre-gastric uh, uh, bypass uh, procedure, uh, they kind of broke down based on the type of AFib they had. And then you look over here, the blue is a regression from persistent to paroxysmal, and then this here, this orange, is no AF. So I kind of look at these two colors, the orange and the dark blue. Um, that kind of gives you an idea of people who, who got better. Um, and with the gastric bypass surgery, they had the largest percent of, of weight loss, 25%, and 70% uh, of patients had some type of regression, either persistent back to paroxysmal or basically, or, or no AF. Uh, sleeve gastrectomy, 19% uh, weight loss, 56% uh, uh, reversion. And then gastro banding, gastric banding, 16% uh, weight loss and 50% reversion. Um, and there was no benefit in long-standing uh, or permanent AF. Um, I think that's another thing to take home to patients. Um, I do think there's a point where once you get past a certain, a certain type of AF, there's really, you know, doing this probably isn't going to uh, benefit you very much from an AFib perspective. Um, and then final kind of risk factor for AF, uh, this was uh, interesting, um, I thought at least, uh, looked at the role of cardiopulmonary fitness and recurrence of AF after ablation, and this was uh, published in Heart Rhythm last year. And they looked at 591 consecutive patients. <clears throat> uh, it was all retrospective from 2012 to 2018, and in those patients undergoing ablation for AFib that also had an exercise stress test uh, within 12 months prior to ablation. Um, and they grouped people into three different groups. Uh, low CRF was defined as less than 85% of their uh, what would be considered predicted MET level. Um, adequate CRF was 85 to 100 percent, and then high uh, cardiopulmonary fitness was if you achieve greater than 100 percent of your predicted METs. Um, and they showed, surprisingly, uh, that there were actually very similar patient characteristics between the three groups. They, as most studies do like this, they list all these different patient characteristics, and there was no difference based on p-value between any of these characteristics, which you would think especially for the low, the low cardiopulmonary fitness, there would be some, some outliers in that regards. Um, but what they found was um, in a mean of follow-up of 32 months, um, arrhythmia recurrence was much higher in patients with low cardiopulmonary fitness, um, uh, 79 versus 54 versus 27.5%. Uh, and the other thing they found is patients uh, in the low uh, fitness arm had a much higher risk of death uh, I think this is rather high, um, but that's what they reported. So uh, these kind of three topics, the alcohol, the bariatric surgery, and this cardiopulmonary fitness, kind of are three, at least the bariatric surgery involving weight loss, are three of the big things that I talk to patients about with AFib in addition to other things such as uh, treatment of sleep apnea. Uh, uh, and I, I think it's something at least I find a continual battle to remember to always educate my patients. It's really easy, especially if you get busy and behind to gloss over this stuff. But I think it's really important, um, uh, at least in discussing uh, with patients, uh, because there are some patients who really take this to heart. It's, it's rare, but they, uh, there are definitely patients that do take it to heart. Um, and any way they can kind of improve their their uh, situation to improve their AF, out AF outcomes uh, is, is important. So final two studies I um, want to talk about. Uh, number one, this, this study looking at um, kind of a subsequent analysis of uh, castle AF type patients. So probably if you don't know the details, you've at least heard of the castle AF trial. But it was a trial, I think, published in 2018 um, that looked at the role of AF ablation in patients with heart failure. And if you look down here in the bottom, just to kind of um, summarize its results, 38% reduction in the endpoints, and I believe it was the same primary endpoint, composite of death and heart failure hospitalizations. So pretty hard, hard endpoint data that really suggested that ablation um, really helped patients with heart, with heart failure, which 
which was interesting. I remember giving talks kind of 2010 to 2013, 14, where I had a bunch of studies showing that afibrillation did nothing for patients with heart failure, and this is the complete opposite. And when you couple that together with uh, analyses from the Cabana trial, you know, it really suggests that ablation in the right patient can, can, can do well uh, by those patients. And this led, at least partially led, to um, uh, changes in the indications for AFib ablation in the uh, targeted update in guidelines in 2019, labeling uh, AFib ablation for patients uh, with AFib and heart failure with the 2B indication for that situation. So it led to some uh, slight changes in, 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 in the, uh, the guidelines. So this study was a uh, retrospective database study that looked at tons of patients. Um, uh, you know, you see the number here. 74, uh, 165 were treated with ablation, and then you had a lot of people in the medical arm. And <clears throat> they looked at this population, and they tried to get an idea of whether or not that population, uh, you could apply the Castle AF, AF uh, study to that population. Because one of the criticisms of the Castle AF study was they had a really tough time enrolling patients. I think they had to screen just tons of patients to, to, to get uh, uh, their study done. Um, and I think that's understood when you look through the inclusion exclusion criteria. So out of all these patients <clears throat> that underwent AF ablation, um, only 7.8% met the Castle AF eligibility. So then you raise the question, does this study really t apply to our, our, uh, our patient population? And that's kind of what this study uh, answers. 91% um, of those patients failed the inclusion criteria, uh, and then 15.5% failed the exclusion criteria. And if you look at it in this population here, despite um, a large percentage of patients not meeting the Castle AF eligibility, um, ablation still led to improvements of the primary endpoint of composite of death and heart failure hospitalization. Not as dramatic as the Castle AF study, but 18% uh, is still pretty good. So I think this kind of adds a little bit more data to what we already have supporting uh, using AFib ablations in patients with heart failure. Again, I think a lot of it is patient selection. Uh, I recently got a consult on a patient who had been in long-standing persistent AFib for, I don't know, I think it was like 15 months. And the specific question is, should we do ablation in him to help his heart failure? And, you know, I, at the end of the day, I'm doing rhythm control on him because I think he's symptomatic from AFib, but I, I, I told him I don't think it's going to really do much for his heart failure. It may be wrong, but uh, I, it's just, at this point, hard for me to believe that that would, uh, that that would uh, help his heart failure. However, you have other patients who I think it's very uh, appropriate and has, has a good chance uh, of helping in that regard. Final study <clears throat> um, was an article last year in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at uh, role of early rhythm control of AFib. And I think this will actually change how I approach uh, some of my patients. Um, so they randomized uh, a little over 2,700 patients, 135 centers. All patients had AFib diagnosed within the last year. And these are kind of the, some of the inclusion criteria. So for the most part, they had to have a CHAS vasca 2 but they also included some other risk factors such as CKD and LVH. Um, median time since diagnosis was 36 days, um, uh, and then they had two arms. One was early rhythm control, which could be ablation or antiarrhythmic drug therapy, versus usual care, which is treatment guided by symptoms, which is what I generally do. You know, if I have someone who comes in for AFib, low burden, I'm really focusing on their symptoms. Are they happy? You know, relatively low burden. You know, uh, not affecting their quality of life, versus early rhythm control out of the gates, you know, being aggressive with drugs or ablation or whatever. And their primary endpoints was composite of CV death, stroke hospitalization, uh, or uh, for heart failure, or ACS. And they also looked at uh, hospitalization days between the two arms. And results there, interesting, was no difference in hospital days between the two arms, which is important. Um, uh, I think it would be 
reasonable, at least I might assume, that patients in this early rhythm control arm would have uh, spend more time in the hospital, hospital initially. And what they showed was uh, favorable results for the early rhythm control arm. So in the early rhythm control arm, um, there were 249 events versus 316 for a hazard ratio of 0.79 and the p-value, uh, which is pretty good, illustrated over here in this graph. So again, I, I actually do think this will change uh, how I handle my patients that have new AFib. I'll probably be a little bit more aggressive in saying, you know, I think we should go, you know, either the AD, AD or even ablation route sooner th rather than later. And uh, this study kind of supports that, that, that rationale. So conclusions um, with regards to the different topics I covered. So CRM, um, pacing ICD options continue to expand. And, you know, the stuff that I showed you, uh, you know, I think we're only going to get more and more different types of devices. It's going to get more and more complex. It'll be really interesting because uh, trying to figure out what device to use in, in certain patients is going to be a uh, is going to be challenging, I think, at various times, especially with more and more options. Um, <clears throat> implantable loop recorders, wearable tech. Um, uh, again, importance is adjudication. You got to review <clears throat> the raw data and make sure that what they're telling you or what the device is telling you is actually correct. Um, uh, they're expanding. They have clear limitations, but I think they uh, do a really good job. And I just emphasize patient education. Um, you know, I, uh, I think we need to have a better way of getting recordings from patients right now, or I'm just kind of telling patients, <clears throat> uh, you know, send it in if you have something. But as more and more of this stuff is available, especially ones that give you a true tracing, um, you know, we're going to get potentially inundated with, with, with uh, information for patients. This, I think, will be a challenge at some point. But patient education can maybe help with that kind of tempering their expectations and, and uh, um, trying to get them not to get too focused on the data they get, especially in certain patients. Um, with regards to AFib, uh, I think we have multiple studies that confirm a role of, uh, of dementia in AFib, and we have data showing that oral anticoagulation helps that, and I think that can help convince some patients uh, to go ahead and uh, bite the bullet and go on a blood thinner. Um, Risk factor modification needs to be emphasized in patients. Uh, you know, the three ones I talked about today, alcohol, weight loss, and fitness. Um, I don't always talk about fitness, but uh, I'll probably start talking about that a little bit more uh, because of this. Um, uh, more and more data confirming the benefit of ablation in some patients with AFib and heart failure. Um, and then uh, finally, early rhythm control, uh, I think may be more important in some patients than others which was uh, a little bit of, well, I think will lead to a change in how I handle some of my patients. So with that, I am done. I don't know if there are any questions or uh, comments. Yeah, Jay. Thanks for that update. That was great. So I have a comment and a question uh, regarding the wearable devices. Um, so last week in clinic, I was told that you know, I had to see a patient for palpitations, you know, which we do so much. And uh, the, the primary care doc had thought ahead and actually had given her a Zeo patch to wear for a week, and so I had that data, and I was reviewing it, and and it showed, oh look, she's having all these little paroxysms of atrial tap, you know, ten to twelve beats, and it's like, ah, oh, I have it already figured out, and so I go in and tell her, and she goes, you know, uh, none of my palpitations that bothered me were those palpitations that I had when wearing that device, and then she pulls out her cardio mobile uh, sheet, and she has all this AFib. It was, you know, never picked up. She didn't happen to have the AFib while she was wearing the device. So I yeah. thought that was like, wow, that's, that, that sort of opened my eyes. Um, so the question is then, as far as for people with cryptogenic stroke and you're concerned about AFib, should we be doing the implantable loop recorders or how long should you really monitor these people, you know, to kind of rule out AFib? As, uh, yeah, I mean, if they don't have <clears throat> any symptoms suggestive of AF, I think the loop recorders are great. That's what they're. That's what they're made for. There's a protocol, J, that is already established with the neurologist. All these patients end up uh, with a linked loop recorder. They monitor them for at least a year, and there are very defined criteria for when they meet what is called a fib or not, six minutes, and so forth. 
and this data is forwarded to the ordering physician often a neurologist. So we do have here a clear protocol for that and these patients end up getting links. Um, that's a good volume of what we do. And as uh, Chris mentioned, it takes a long time sometimes to adjudicate because the stakes are very high, obviously. And um, the device will call BACs and stuff as a fib. So it, it's time consuming, actually. I'd rather, I'd rather read 20 pacemaker um, yeah. interrogation than one link. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> It's true, because you can't just say, oh, let's just continue to watch, and then they'll have another stroke, and it's truly a fib, or put them on anticoagulation, and that's not what it is. Although uh, my threshold for calling a fib, these were beautiful tracings that Chris said, you can see every single P wave. That's not really life. That was a, yeah, that was, a, that was an easy one. <laughs> that was a very easy one. But often, if you, if, if, if I'm 50-50 if I'm and the patient had a stroke, um, Rather call it a fib than not. I mean, maybe 50 50 is unfair. I'll look at more data, but yeah. So, yeah, I mean, their tracings are all look at for five to 10 minutes. I go through, look at EKGs, and I'm like, I still don't know. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes. So, as far as I'll make a comment about your, your comment about the, the Zio, very common for primary doctor, whoever, to order a Zio. All this stuff shows up, and then they come in because they're sent for the Zio results, but then you start talking to them and they're like, well, I didn't feel anything on this while I wore the Zio. So really, the, the thing I do like about the Zio is it <clears throat> gives you all the patient events listed, and it's really easy <clears throat> to go through those events with patients. Um, it, it allows you to kind of correlate them pretty easily with that device. So you really gotta talk and make sure that, they, uh, that what they have correlates with, with what's found on the monitor, because it often does not. Yeah, as we, as structural uh, interventionist and surgeons, we are getting more and more patients who have tricuspid regurg, which is not benign with pacemaker lead. And we look at micra as an option there. Uh, would you think that that's actually a reality, or that's just what we think? That are we, are we doing more micra pacemakers because of that? Do lead extraction in these patients and then do micra? Would that be an indication? Um, potentially, I, I mean, the way I approach that, I still, I, I still look, do, you know, do they need atrial pacing? Um, <clears throat> the, the trick, you know, what I talked today was the micro AV, which was the micro that allows you to get some degree of AV synchrony. The problem with, and I don't know all the data, but I know tricuspid intervention affects the ability of the micro AV to work the way it should. I, I can't give you any numbers. But it's not as easy as just, oh, they had a tricuspid valve intervention and do this. So it's, it's tough. I know those situations definitely come up. Um, really, when, I, uh, when I'm looking at a patient, do they need atrial pacing is the main thing, or AV synchrony. Um, definitely in patients with permanent AF uh, or high burden AF, that would be a great option. But then the standard micro would be appropriate, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with you, Chris. And it, you know, it did, I, I had actually a couple of patients just like that that um, ended with, uh, actually they didn't have lead, but they had bad PR, and the question is how to manage that after Paul was gonna do a triclip and so forth, and we ended putting a, a micro because they had permanent AFib, that's a different deal. Um, this is a very challenging, as you know, topic, because we get patients, well, they had 30-year-old lead, and, Extraction is not easy, and what's the plan for that? So unless there is a clear, either surgical or percutaneous plan for the tricuspid valve, or a recent implant where we see impingement, we, we're being very hesitant to just take the leap for extraction risk. Uh, but then going to the micro question, micro AV is not perfect. Uh, it's not good for patients who are active. Uh, even in patients with normal tricuspid valve, where you can see all the hemodynamic changes uh, there. So. And also the, the QRS complex is not perfect. Now we have these four French leads, actually we've used them and they have much less chance of causing impingement on the, on the lead. Uh, and um, depending on what kind of intervention they're getting for the tricuspid, if they're going for surgical intervention, we always talk about potentially using epicardial leads and removing the lead, so that becomes a, probably a better option. But if it's a percutaneous intervention, then you're right, and they have a fib. Um, we, I have patients um, with Paul actually where we put a micro and he intervened on the tricuspid valve if they have AFib. Yeah. Is there something in pipeline where you could 
have uh, leadless atrial and leadless ventricle talking to each other or uh, lead based atrial and a leadless ventricle. I mean, that's something which makes sense to me today because you know we have been crossing tricuspid valves. There's no way when you place the leads, uh, if it is four French or not, I means still you can go yep. through the cordae. Yep. There's no way to know it. Uh, so that seems to be like a logical way forward. Yeah, I, th I think at some point, I'm not aware of any uh, mainstream study. Uh, I'm sure the different device companies are investigating those things as we speak, but uh, I'm sure we'll get there, yeah. is my, my opinion, yeah. Sorry, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I, you know, I, this was fantastic. It's yeah. a great, great view of, of what's new. Um, two, two questions, when I was, it was fascinating to look at uh, the risk of, or the reduction in the risk of dementia um, with anticoagulation and how regardless to your chat VASC score, you get benefit from anticoagulation, which brings a lot of questions there when you counsel patients and uh, what if their chat VASC is one, is, did they look at that? I know three was the cut point. So that, that's a question I'm wondering what's your take on it. Then the second comment and question is related to uh, AFib and heart failure. And I know there was strict criteria for um, the Castle AFib study and you showed the, that even those who didn't meet the criteria of benefits from ablation. But I can't tell you how many times um, I see patients where you know, physicians have gotten comfortable with rate control strategy because the average heart rate on a monitor is X, Y, or Z. And in my mind, a, even, even a rate, rate, when rate control is acceptable, and in some of these patients we have to accept rate control, that um, the definition of rate control seems to be a little uh, lax, and I think we have to be very strict, and these patients don't do well when they're active and their heart rate goes up to 160, but by the way, their average heart rate is 83. So I think, I have seen a lot of these patients actually over the years where eventually um, either being very aggressive with rhythm control or rate control even with an AV node and a IV truly affected their, not only their symptoms, but their ejection fraction improved significantly. So just kind of, a, I wanna see what you think of this subgroup of uh, patients where Rate control has to be really rate control, and we have to be really careful before we say that's just get good enough. Yeah, no, I'll address that first. Um, I, I see the same type of situation, not uncommonly, and you know, I think part of that probably stems from the lenient versus strict rate control study uh, in the New England Journal, you know, years ago, made everyone a little, you know, more comfortable with higher average heart rates, and other than just. Uh, you know, curtailing your your opinion to that specific patient, I don't have a good answer. Um, it's because I don't I don't know what's the official cutoff. I guess I would probably look at clinically: are they struggling with heart failure? You know, what is their ejection fraction done? Um, and then couple that with, you know, symptom uh, symptoms associated with AFib or the rapid rates, and kind of put all that together into in to trying to determine what I would recommend for them to do, but I don't know if I have a good idea of what's the official cutoff, but, but you're absolutely right. Um, uh, it, it, that's, that's an issue. Um, as far as um, the first question you had, um, the benefit of oral anticoagulation, which has asked less than two, um, other than looking at the data, you know, there's the bar there is pretty wide, so I, I don't know what to take of, uh, of it from this study here. Um, you know, I don't know if I'd really get into the nitty gritty different specific situations um, when I would counsel patients uh, uh, about this, uh, about dementia risk and possible improvement with oral anticoagulation. I would just kind of stick with to generalizations. Um, uh, and in patients with a CHADS VASC of 0 1, sure, I would, I might struggle in what I tell them, um, but if I have someone who's kind of on the fence, uh, first of all, Chaz Vasco is zero, except in rare situations. I don't, I don't recommend an oral anticoagulation. But, you know, if I have someone with a Chaz Vasco one and they're more concerned about the uh, ischemic complications of AFib, you know, I'll twist their arm a little bit more uh, to do oral anticoagulation. I think this kind of gives you a little a bit of data to help make that argument. Yeah. We do just have two online questions. Yeah. 
Uh, the first of which is uh, patients seem more concerned about their caffeine consumption than alcohol. Yes, erroneously. But what are you advising on caffeine consumption? Uh, kind of my party comments are moderation is the key. Um, you know, usually with caffeine, they know it when it's an issue. Um, you know, they have already associated caffeine with PACs or atrial runs or even AFib, and, and you can get that from the history. And in those patients, I say, you know, really minimize it or ideally get it out of the picture. Um, so that's really all I say. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, with caffeine, it's more of the initial effect of caffeine on the irritability of the heart and the rhythm issues. Alcohol, though, there's a whole nother dynamic and, and set of uh, implications. You know, binge drinking, high volume alcohol intake, you know, it, it leads to structural changes in the atrium. Uh, it, you know, a lot of other things that, that are much more complex and, and uh, harmful compared to caffeine. So uh, caffeine, I say, you know, moderation is the key, and if you start noticing there's association be between your rhythm issues and caffeine, you probably need to can it, ideally. So. Perfect. That makes sense. Thank you for that. You're, you're, yeah, you're absolutely right. Caffeine is like a, it's like a no-line zone when you counsel a patient, because if you look at population data, you know, there's no clear association, actually. If, if you look at uh, you know, 10,000 people and you look at caffeine, but you're exactly right, Chris. There are some patients that get AFib even when they eat chocolate. And yeah. They know it. They and smell they, it. And yeah. I'm not kidding. And they test whether uh, their ablation worked or not by going and doing these things. So, like Chris said, every patient is different. And for that patient, caffeine makes a difference. They should avoid it. But unlike alcohol, like Chris said, there's no clear like data to say, Oh, this amount of caffeine now, I'm not talking about uh, um, energy drinks. I'm talking about cough, coffee. Cup of coffee yeah, yeah. So yeah, Chris is exactly, it's challenging. So I, I'm just yeah. agreeing and echoing what Chris said. Yeah, very interesting, absolutely. Um, so the last online question is just about the, the massive influx of data with the wearable devices, and how do you see the management of that data, and will that become a problem? Um, I think it's already an issue. Uh, I don't know how we're going to man. I mean, I have patients that, and I know we're not supposed to do this, but they'll, patients that I know real well for a long time, they have my cell phone, they'll text me a, a snapshot of their, of their, uh, their eye rhythm tra cardio mobile app tracing. And I know we're not supposed to do that, but it's, it's just, it, you know, like you said, there's just so much data out there. I, I don't have a good answer for it, and I think it's only going to get worse. Um, we need a more efficient way to kind of manage all this data. Um, uh, so I, I don't have a good answer. It's going to be a continually, uh, continual education process for us because, you know, as I showed you, the, uh, the technology is just going to get better and better and people are going to get more savvy about it. And, um, you know, we're just going to get more options in that regard. So I can say from a program standpoint, we do not, um, we do not have patients have ability to do transmissions in a routine way where it's integrated in the medical record. Uh, Check, we have yeah. not done that because it, it is an option for some. But as Chris said, we, we don't have the capabilities. Uh, we don't have the staff. We don't, there's medical legal uh, implications. How often can they send it? We can bill for it. Not that that's not only for, but billing is we can hire people to do the work, right? But there's no really, although there are some, they're getting, you know, getting better in understanding it and setting mechanisms where, um, you know, we can do that. But at this point, at least here in this program, the way we, we manage this is we manage it just like someone having a home blood pressure machine. If you do have a wearable device and you collect data, you, you have an option of bringing it to your clinic visit or you can call and say, you know what, yesterday I, my blood pressure was 200, yesterday I had palpitations and a transmission, then a nurse answers, send that information, reviews it with Dr. Kruger, then we'll deal with it. But moving forward, there will have to be different ways and it has to be integrated in a kind of a care delivery model where the insurance kind of, uh, the payers appreciate that as total cost of care reduction and they invest in it. it. It's a much bigger problem for providers. I know in healthcare providers get the burden of fixing everything. I don't think there's something that we as providers can fix. 
others, yeah, including payers and insurance companies and, and healthcare systems and, and so forth, have to help us um, manage this data. Yeah, I mean, when you think of the sheer volume of the potential influx of this, it's just kind of mind boggling. I mean, we already have, you think of how much time we devote to implantable loop recorder tracings and transmissions. Um, uh, and that's just, that pales in comparison to what the volume we could get from all uh, these other device devices. So it'll be, it'll be tough, um, but we'll see. So. Thank you very much. Um, is there anything else? No, that's all I got. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you.